for me, Petra modernity um, is the everyday vernacular landscape of much of the United States and North America, and one could even say much of the developed world. And what that looks like on the ground uh, is uh, suburbia, made possible by 41,000 miles of freeway system, which was created after World War II, although on the books as of 1944 in the United States, um, it looks like suburbia, it looks like the suburban freeway complex, it looks like the um, strip malls that have taken the place of Main Street, as it's nostalgically remembered in political rhetoric. Um, it looks like parking towers and parking lots. Um, it looks like a world that's been built primarily for automobiles. Um, it's a world of tremendous efficiency and convenience, so long as the resource, the cheap energy, petrol fuel, is available. The minute that that becomes scarce, or even too costly, as we saw happen in the U.S. back in July of 2008, thereabouts, um, suddenly petromodernity becomes a potential landscape of apocalypse. The, the affective connection that we have to petromodernity and its, and its built environments um, was talked about very early on by the philosopher Kate Soper, who talks about troubled pleasures. Uh, and also the possibility of perhaps creating an erotics of sustainability that matches the kind of hot media that was given us in the 20th century by cars and freeways. And the hot media is a, a term of Marshall McLuhan's to describe media that really speaks immediately to our senses and um, satisfies us so well that we don't really even have a critical distance upon it. That effective investment was also talked about um, in the work of sociologists like Mimi Scheller, um, who's written about, from a feminist perspective actually, about the ways in which suburban moms are, are um, cathected to their SUVs and how that kind of automobile, uh, so inefficient, so unsustainable ultimately in the long run, um, confers a sense of, of safety and has come to symbolize um, a necessary and responsible caretaking of one's children and family. Um, so these affective investments uh, come up again and again and again and become problematic for policymakers. Suzanne Mosier, who is a person who's written about climate change policy, has found um, in a collected book that she wrote about climate change policy that people who finally come to understand the science of climate change and can be convinced to believe and not only climate models, but the actual events of freak uh, climate and weather that we're seeing across the world, that such people, uh, one of the first responses that they often offer on questionnaires is the wish to buy a larger car so as to protect themselves from the extremities of this new weather. Um, the IPPR, which puts out a report periodically about climate change and has talked a lot about trying to brand it as a, kind of, as a lifestyle, a new lifestyle, a new consumerism, uh, also worries about those effective investments and how to, uh, in a sense, not just change the narrative, but change the embodied memories of people who have lived so long in a world of the petromodern. I was very influenced by the work of the Center for Land Use Interpretation, which is a, an arts research collective, uh, also a bit of a hub for cultural geography, uh, the primary office is in Culver City, California, but they have offices throughout the U.S. and they have one in Houston. And what I love about what Cluey is doing, the Cluey is doing in Houston in particular, um, because that's a site I recently visited, is they're talking about narrative in terms of bodily practice. They're getting people out um, in the rivers, in particularly the Buffalo Bayou, the major urban river of the city of Houston, and allowing people to see how that water transects the space of the energy capital and makes it, in fact, more readable on a human scale. So water, interestingly, becomes a medium for narrative intelligence for the cluey. You go out on a boat with them, you take a boat tour, and you literally move through the space of oil production, re refining, transshipment, etc.
and begin to feel yourself in relation to those spaces whose scales are so vast that they aren't meant to be represented or representable. Um, Petromelancholia is a term that I brought into being because I was in search of a way of describing a feeling state that I don't think actually has a name. And of course I was drawing on Freud's definition of melancholia and this idea of a kind of grief that is ceaseless, that is non-productive, and that is not socially recognized as uh, positive in the sense that mourning is. In mourning we eventually take another object. The possibility of replacement moving forward, futurity, exists within the rubric of mourning and it does not within the rubric of melancholia. But there are aspects, specific aspects of Freudian melancholia that don't apply to what I'm talking about. When I say petromelancholia, I'm talking about the grieving of conventional oil infrastructures and conventional oil resources um, which no longer exist or at least do not exist in the quantities that they once did. The grieving of a culture of endless, even limitless expansion that was proposed atop the landscapes of conventional oil. Starting in the U.S. roughly in the late 1920s, around 1930 is peak oil discovery in the U.S. Um, that grief is a grief not just for the resource, but it's also a grief for a certain vision of the U.S. and a certain idea of the American century when America, of course, only refers to the United States. A lot of our modern subjectivities that we hold dear and that are, in fact, particularly dear to people like myself on the left, you know, feminist subjectivity, environmentalist subjectivity, queer subjectivity, um, came into being in part because of the possibilities for expansion and cultural elaboration and media production that cheap energy made possible. I don't necessarily see a clear path out of this. I do think, frighteningly enough, that it is disaster more than anything else that is creating the possibility of not only a new kind of arts practice, but a new politics. I think there is some hope that the communities of the Global South that are most ex exploited by oil production and um, extraction could potentially work through some coalitional strategies. I do think that um, in our own country, the United States, the Global South touches the edges of the Gulf Coast, places like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. And some of the best environmental justice theory and practice in terms of um, demands that actually made their way into policy for the protection of communities came and has come and is coming out of those places. But it's a terrible thing to think that the people most afflicted are those who are also carrying the burden of true change.
What is petrofiction? Good question. <laughs> I work in Scottish literature primarily, yeah? And one of the most enormous infrastructural features of Scottish society is offshore oil, yeah? So one would expect that to be registered in the literature of Scotland and even in the wider sense, the literature of the United Kingdom, right? Because 30% of GDP um, is based from North Sea oil. Um, but culturally, it's minimally registered. It hardly appears for the last 40 years. It absolutely underpins the narrative of contemporary Britain. It's the story even in some respects the survival um, of the British state for the last 40 years, in its present guise that is. But when one looks for it culturally, directly and explicitly, the thing that we would call petrofiction, the literature that registers oil directly, that talks about oil, that um, mentions things about the oil industry, that takes uh, oil as a narrative, um, as a story, oil as a, a, a plot device, oil as a, a, you know, a whole sea of metaphors, doesn't really exist um, in the capacity that one would think it, it, it should. So when one starts to look abroad, right, you need to start to look at elsewhere for models. So the best way I thought to do this would be to think about other oil producing countries, yeah? Um, and actually, the same kind of thing exists there, the same kind of situation exists. It's not directly apparent. You have to really search it out, say, for example, in Venezuelan literature, you have to look for it in Saudi Arabian literature, you have to look for it in Mexican literature. It's not enormously configured within the whole of the kind of literary field of those oil producing countries. It's maybe consigned or limited to one or two texts. But once you start to stick all them together, you begin to see a connecting theme. Um, and the connecting theme, of course, the subject is oil itself, right? Its extraction, what it does for the kind of social world run about it and so on. And despite the fact that there are vastly different geographies, vastly different spaces, vastly different times of extraction, you get very similar textual experiences, very similar, similar textual structures, um, similar plot lines, similar characters, similar events, uh, similar um, outcomes. Um, even similar forms. And it seems to me that you need a world provenance, a world perspective in order to really kind of like grab what petrofiction is.
Well, post sustainability would be rather than sort of trying to balance accounts, okay, which is pretty much the way conventional sustainability, in my take anyway, is, is worked out. In other words, uh, carbon footprint. You come up with a very precise measure of the amount of uh, fossil fuel, for example, or resources consumed per capita. Uh, after you've measured that in a very precise way, then you can lower the per capita consumption so that the uh, amount consumed per person balances out with the amount of resources available per capita. And then you have the famous consumption of one planet per person. Uh, you know, the, the Wacker, Nagel, and Ries in, in our ecological footprint, that book stated, well, the problem is every person, uh, if every person on the planet consumed as much as the typical North American, you'd have, you'd have to have six planets <laughs> for each person. So the idea being, and for social justice as well, and economic justice, you want to get that down to one person. The problem with that is you're, you're quantifying resources in a way that uh, is perhaps necessary. I'm not denying that it's necessary, but in a way it, it sort of falsifies, to my mind, the question of expenditure. And by, I think, if we can rethink what it is to spend, then you can have sustainability as a sort of after effect of a different way of spending. Okay, so if we see uh, our surplus is not being so much a surplus of stuff that we have to dig out of the ground, manufacture, consume, and dump, right, uh, but rather uh, a surplus, for example, of uh, human energy, so to speak, uh, that is what we uh, can perform in, uh, not simply in daily life, but in, for example, in uh, sacred activities in, uh, there's a religious component to this too, in uh, um, the kinds of uh, rituals or the kinds of uh, socially charged activities that tend to bring society together, then we would uh, perhaps, maybe inadvertently is the wrong word, but that sustainability would be much closer to being uh, achieved. I mean, that kind of argument is not that foreign to what a lot of other people are saying. Maybe my terminology is a little different, but the idea that uh, a rewarding social life comes not just from buying and dumping stuff, but comes from uh, carrying out activities that are perhaps typically considered artistic activities or leisure activities uh, in the current culture and resituating those and seeing those as central, then you're going to move closer to sustainability, not because you're doing a lot of measuring and calculating, but rather because you've radically changed the orientation not only of your personal life, but of social life in general. But just, I guess, as you could say, uh, as with modernism and postmodernism, uh, you wouldn't be assuming that somehow post-sustainability would supplant sustainability, uh, if you see what I'm saying. It's not a question of a kind of dialectical movement where, oh, we're done with sustainability now, now we can move to this other one. Uh, because obviously one, uh, but, but the danger, of course, is sort of lapsing into a kind of technocracy, where all you're doing is establishing a regime of equalizing energy inputs and energy outputs without really thinking about uh, things like, well, for example, pleasure <laughs> or perhaps deeper, uh, quote unquote, deeper human drives, transgressive drives of various sorts, be they uh, erotic drives, what Bataille calls eroticism, uh, be they uh, sort of death drives, be they the sacred, uh, those sorts of uh, fundamental uh, drives that uh, operate in society, maybe bring it together, also sometimes they uh, break it apart.